we're going to look at who is the Son in Scripture, and I'm going to cover some basic stuff, and then uh, after the third session after lunch, who is the Holy Spirit, and why do we believe the Holy Spirit's a person from a biblical standpoint? And then from there, we have, I forget which order now, I think it's uh, Pastor Tinkum, Dr. Lake, whichever order. And then I have a closing segment where I look at some more specific texts and monogonase and things like that. And so there may be some unresolved questions from this one that will get picked up in the final one uh, that I do. So I do the first three, then I get to actually rest on the Sabbath for a little bit, and, then, and we'll go, go from there. Um, I want to look at some biblical foundations now and particularly focus on the Son and the deity of Christ. So we are on. Here we go. A little background information. Uh, our typical, when you go to websites that are non-Adventist or Adventist, doesn't matter, trying to show a biblical basis for the Trinity, I tend to find some typical tactics. For example, looking for all three members together in the same text, such as the baptismal formula in Matthew 28, baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Ha! Trinity. Okay. So that's one. Or you find a text with the Father and the Son, or the Son and the Spirit, and you start to assemble these together, and you can tie the three together. Okay. So kind of the two-thirds majority rule, um, especially showing relationships or functions that overlap. Or if we can find each of the three doing the same functions. So God the Father is said to forgive sin, but Jesus is said to forgive sin. One example. I am going to take the idea especially of shared attributes and functions and not merely just because we found three names in one text, though I do think Matthew 28 is a significant text. And our anti-non-Trinitarians will argue that this is some kind of later edition. Uh, but when you go to the scholarship, there is just zero evidence credible of any later edition, unlike the first John 5 text. Uh, it just doesn't exist. Um, they quote some stuff from church fathers and stuff, but when we actually look at the manuscripts that we have and the fragments we have, and believe me, the critical scholarship would love to find something to challenge Christianity with with a bad text on. So if Matthew 28, 19 had any problems, we would have heard about it by now because um, the critical scholarship loves to try to destroy faith in the Bible. And so the fact that there's no meaningful leverage on this, uh, I just, um, everybody I know in New Testament scholarship says it just doesn't exist. You know, 1 John 5, clear evidence, you know, clear evidence. So, um, but aside from that, I'm looking more at these overlaps. Also, um, we have the challenge of New versus Old Testament. Um, clearly, the New Testament operates at a greater level of revelation than some of the folk in the... You know, it's understandable, right? Even Hebrews points at this. Uh, God spoke of old through the prophets, but now in these last days He has spoken through His Son. Something greater than Moses is here, you know. Not that it overturns Moses, but it's somehow clearer and more expansive. And so we have to be careful on the one hand of reading things into the Old Testament that probably were not understood there to those readers. And yet at the same time, Peter in either first or second Peter, and I'm forgetting which uh, book, where he says those Prophets wrote knowing they weren't writing for their own day, they were writing for you, and they didn't understand what they were writing. <laughs> and so there's that balance of they may not have fully understood what they were writing, 
But in light of the New Testament, now we get it. And so we've got to play those uh, balances. Um, the Old Testament in particular has basically no language of father, son, in, in, in God, really. It's just, it's not dealt with there. Uh, the one text, and I'm going to add lib for a moment, um, the one text which is not in my notes today, if we have to get into this, I'll try, I'm, I'm not fresh, but uh, is Proverbs 30, where we have this question about what is his, his name and what is his son's name. And I wrote a paper on that for Adventist Theological Society that's just come out in their journal. We're about a year behind. And uh, that may be available on the ATS website in the next six to nine months. Um, I'll, I'll take a little uh, professional pride in that Richard Davidson at the seminary in the response to my paper said it was the best effort he had seen on Proverbs 30. And, um, uh, and in my opinion, that text is a parallel with Job, and it's asking, can you give me the name of a man or his son who has gone to heaven and found the secret knowledge? It's not talking about Godhead at all. And you can make a very plausible argument that that phrase in Proverbs 30 has nothing to do with the Godhead. Church fathers have cited it in reference to the Godhead, Augustine, for example. They just look at it and see the language of father and son and say, huh, there's Trinity in the Old Testament. And I'm like, you didn't do your exegesis. It's not even talking about deity. It's talking about, find me the sage or the prophet who's gone to heaven and gotten this secret knowledge that I wish I had. And, uh, and you need to be humble and know the limits of your language and put your hand over your mouth uh, when you don't know what you're talking about. Uh, that's, that's that chapter. Um, so with that caveat, I just don't find Father, Son. This is a New Testament lingo um, this way. However, spirits all over the Old Testament, although how you, again, in a, at the same time, in a much more undefined, uh, not fully always clear way, but as you meet the Holy Spirit more fully in the New Testament, you start to recognize Him better in the Old Testament. And you'll see that in number three. Alrighty, the classic text that we find that seem to mention all three, Matthew 28, 19, I've already talked about that, so I'm going to keep going. Uh, Revelation 1, we have greetings from the one who is and is, is to come, from Jesus Christ, and from the sevenfold spirit. The baptism of Jesus seems to have all three presents, Jesus in the water, God in heaven, the dove of Holy Spirit in between. also found in Luke. Galatians 4, God sends this, quote, spirit of his son into our hearts. Uh, the spirit of the son is not the son, it's the, i.e. the spirit coming from his son. Hence, people see all three persons here. Now, I'm kind of reporting, uh, other than Matthew 28 and maybe Revelation 1, uh, these are incidental comments that probably point to Trinity, but... Um, I like to be cautious on how heavily I leverage these texts. But it's evidence that they're thinking this way. A uh, two-thirds majority in Acts, Stephen filled with the Holy Spirit, gazes into heaven, sees Jesus seated with God, who we would understand to be God the Father. Uh, so there's a two-thirds. Um, Romans 1, God promises a son he appoints, by the way, in Hebrews and Romans 1, the son is a son by appointment, not by begetting. He's appointed as son. We'll get into a little bit more of that later. Uh, but he promises a son. He appoints this son, but he does it according to the Spirit. So some see the three here as well. Uh, now, again, the potential problems with this is that we may be pushing on the text perhaps to make it say a bit more than Paul intended uh, to say. On the other hand, incidental comments can tell you something about a person's deeper thinking. 
And so these somewhat incidental comments, I think, point to us uh, in a direction, but we have to use them fairly. But a list of this magnitude suggests that this is not an isolated way of thinking, that there's some kind of preponderance here. And I would suggest that there's larger uh, biblical theology that creates support for a triune view of the Godhead than just proof texts like this. I'm going to take a method of that I'm calling a biblical theological approach where I examine how the Bible and how each member of the Godhead is credited with attributes and functions that are restricted to deity or um, are made analogous to another member of the Trinity in, in so doing. Uh, now, almost no one struggles with God the Father being God. That's kind of a duh. So, um, I pulled this from a class. In this class or in this symposium, um, we're going to assume a common knowledge of the classic attributes of God the Father. No beginning, no end, all knowing, all wise, you know, these, you know, et cetera. Good in character, loving, just, et cetera. In the Bible, there are two things. Uh, let me make an analogy. Uh, when I have time, which I don't have much of, I like to pull out the binoculars and identify birds. Um, before I felt the call to ministry, I wanted to be an ornithologist, which is a simple way of saying I wanted to be a bird brain. And so, um, <clears throat> um, so when we look at a bird through the scope or the binoculars, and let's pick uh, the doozies, warblers. Any bird watchers here? Yeah, yeah, right. Warblers are fun, right? Yeah. Okay. And so how do we figure out what warbler it is? Hopefully, hopefully in the spring when they have their best plumage, right? But, you know, or summer. But um, we look to see, does it have a ring around the eye or a stripe through the eye? Or is there no stripe? You know, is there a wing bar, no wing bar? So we call these field marks, right? And then you assemble enough field marks, you say, this must be a prothonotary warbler or whatever, right? I don't know why that particular name came to my head, but it did. Um, there are two big field marks that if you see these field marks in your binoculars, you know you've encountered God. Two unique attributes of God followed by several functions of God, okay? The first attribute is creation. Creating out of nothing in particular. Not like the potter who creates out of pre-existing material, but there's nothing there and you create something literally out of nothing. Okay? That's deity. In other words, when we find the unmade maker you found deity, you found God. And this is highlighted in Isaiah 40 and 44. Those uh, verse selection there in Isaiah 40 and the whole of chapter 44 where God is compared to an idol and the idol a craftsman makes, but God is the maker of all. He's the unmade maker. And... Um, and most of Isaiah 40 to 45 is highlighting the uniqueness of God as the creator. Right? Third angel's message. Worship him who made or created the heavens and the earth. So when you find the unmade maker, you know you found deity. God is not a made created being. The second one also in Isaiah and a number of texts again between Isaiah 40 and 45 into 46, is that God has foreknowledge. He knows the future. The idol gods don't know the future. And so creation and foreknowledge are the two big field marks. If you find both of those, either of those, even more so, you find both of those, you know you've hit deity. Now, in addition to that, Something went too. F there are five functions 
And I'm not saying these are the only five, but these seem to be five major unique functions of deity. Number one, being worshipped. This is related to the creation issue, right? Worship him who? Made. Okay? If you're worshipping something that is made, that's what we call idolatry, right? Okay? So I think, uh, and so in Revelation 4, worthy are you, O Lord, to receive honor, glory, etc., and worship because you made. See, it's creation that gives God the right to be worshipped. Um, creatures are not worshipped. And so we have this, and on the back side, uh, I mentioned in the brackets there, John twice in Revelation falls down to, quote, worship the angel. And what does the angel say? Don't do that, only worship God. Okay? Peter and Cornelius. Um, Cornelius falls down, don't do that, you know. Um, and so the creature knows it's inappropriate. Second one is forgiving sin. Psalm 103, etc., only God can forgive sin. Matthew 9, Mark 2, etc. I don't think that's a controversial one, so we're going to keep rolling. Being innately holy, you alone, alone Lord, are holy. Some of the Psalms, Isaiah 6, I saw God high and holy and lifted up. Revelation 4, Leviticus 11, Again, the holiness of God as an innate quality. Uh, his title, the Holy One of Israel, as a title of God in a number of places, um, uh, etc. And I see my editor's eye forgot to close the parentheses. Self existence. So John 5 talks about the Father having life in himself. His life is not dependent upon another. And then he says, the human son has been granted that same ability in his human form to be self-existent um, this way. Uh, Exodus 4, the burning bush. Moses says, what is your name? We translate it in Greek and English as I am who I am. In Hebrew, probably closer to I will be whom I will be. It's literally uh, the first person of the verb of being. Uh, but Hebrew has no present tense. <laughs> so that's the fun. They have past and future. Because by the time you said it, it's already past, right? <laughs> so it's either, the point is by, predict, by showing God as being the God of, of the becoming is showing God as the only self-defined being. God can make himself whatever he wants to be. Whereas as a creature, a great bit of who you are was defined by your maker. You don't get to be everything you choose to be. Okay. By the way, that's a very significant issue in today's politics because we're trying to now force by law the absolute right of self-definition of a creature who is defined by a creator. <laughs> so this self-existence, uh, I am the self-defining of God. Um, he is the God of being. He has no beginning. He just is. And eternal, from everlasting to everlasting, you are God. And in Isaiah, God is the first and the last. No, no one before me first, no one comes after me. I'm all inclusive. Does that language of first and last ring a bell? Revelation, I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end, first and last, is drawing from Isaiah. And we'll come back to that a little bit later. So, just to back up again, five functions, being worshipped, forgiving sin, being innately holy, self-existence, and eternality. And then the two field markers, you're the creator and you have foreknowledge. <laughs> Introducing the Son of God as deity. John 1.3, the Son is called God. 
In the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Direct use of the title to the Son. He is God uh, this way. Secondly, he is called innately holy as God is holy. The angel said to Mary, she's asked, how is this going to be? The Holy Spirit will come upon you and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. Therefore, the child to be born of you will be called what? Holy, holy Son of God. We're going to come back to this text a little bit later for other reasons. Ellen White's comment on this verse these words do not refer to any human being except the Son of the infinite God. Because she's picking up on that holy. In Revelation 3 7, Christ self designates himself as the Holy One, as holy. So he calls himself innately holy, um, or the Holy One in modern translations. Ditto. And yet in Revelation 15, 4, God Almighty alone is holy. Wait a minute. How is Jesus calling himself holy if God Almighty alone is holy? Either Jesus is lying or what? He's got to be God Almighty. <laughs> or I got a problem in my biblical text. <laughs> Christ forgives sins. Remember the story where they let him down, the paralytic down through the roof, right? Um, Jesus says, your sins are forgiven. And the first part of this challenge was correct from the leaders there. They were saying, who is this guy forgiving sin? Only God can forgive sin. Is that a correct theological statement? Yes, only God can forgive sins, but Jesus forgives sins, and to prove I have this power to forgive sin, he heals the guy, right? He says, that you may know, that the Son of Man has power on earth to forgive sin, rise up and walk. Whoa, Jesus is now performing a function reserved to deity alone. Then we get to Christ as Creator. This one gets a little bit interesting. John 1, 3. Through him, nothing was made. That was made. First of all, if Christ is somehow made or created, like the Jehovah's Witnesses say, an Arius, then there would be one thing that was made without him, himself. And then everything else that was made, he could help make. But John says, nothing that was made was made without him. So this is telling us that John sees Christ as unmade. He's the unmade maker. Colossians 1, all things were made by or through Christ. He uses both the N and the D-I in there. Uh, verse 16, and he pre-exists all things. That is, he is unmade. And yet, Paul also states that all things were created through the same language, God, Romans 11. So it's created through agency language Christ, and yet, Romans 11, agency language, it's created through God. I'm getting a headache. We're continuing. We like John 1 as the easiest text on the divinity of Christ. But I think Hebrews 1 is the single most packed chapter, and we're going to live in Hebrews 1 for a little while. Let's pull out our Bibles and just do a little reading. Um, we'll risk the clock on this one. 
So iPhone to the rescue here. And I think I'm going to say a few words about Hebrews 1. I'll decide when to say them additional to this. Long ago, I'm starting in verse 1, and I'm going to be going to read most of the chapter here. Long ago, at many times and in many ways, God spoke to our fathers by the prophets. Verse 2, but in these last days, He has spoken to us by His Son, whom He has appointed heir of all things. Go back uh, into the middle of that. Whom He has what? Appointed. Appointed. That's a very key word here. Okay. Whom He has appointed heir of all things, through whom He did what? Created the world. There's that agency language again. He, who is this He? In verse 3. Who is the He? The Son. He is the radiance of the glory of God and the exact imprint of His nature. That's a tough Greek phrase, a bit of a dynamic translation here, but not bad. And He, who is the He? The Son, Jesus. What does He do? Upholds the universe by His word of power. After making purifications for sin, what's that? What event? The cross. We have a temporal marker here. After he made purification for sins, that's his death on the cross, he sat down where? At the right hand of God, right? Jesus died before he was installed in heaven, right? Okay. Having become as much superior to angels as he is, the name he has inherited is more excellent than theirs. For to which of God's angels did God ever say, You are my son, today I have begotten you, or again I will be to him a father, and he will be to me a son, both from Psalm 2, as I recall. And again, when he brings the firstborn into the world, he says, Let all God's angels do what? Worship Worship him. And of the angels, he says, he makes his uh, angels, winds, his ministers, flames of fire. But of the son, he says, Your throne, O God, is forever and ever the scepter of your righteous scepter, I got lost here. The scepter of uprightness is the scepter of your kingdom. You have loved righteousness and hated wickedness. Therefore, God, your God, has anointed you with the oil of gladness beyond your companions. And you, Lord, laid the foundations of the earth in the beginning. The heavens are the work of your hands. They will perish, but you remain. They will wear out like a garment, like a robe you will roll them up, Like a garment, they will be changed, but you are the same. Your years will have no end. But to which of the angels has he ever said, sit at my right hand until I make your enemies a footstool under my feet? Another quote from Psalm 2. What is this chapter describing? In the context of Hebrews... This is describing the installation ceremony of Christ after the resurrection into his office as the king priest like Melchizedek. And it's in this installation ceremony, and notice what I'm going to set up, verse 5. For to which of the angels did God ever say, you are my son, etc.? Um, so in verse 6, and again, when he brings the firstborn into the world, he says, who's doing the talking? God the Father. And we have this contrast that in this installation ceremony, God says things about Christ that he does not say about angels. That's the point. Because he's showing Christ as superior to the angels. And the historical context likely is we're dealing with Gnostic 
theology that came out of Gnostic Judaism where as part of your salvation you had to navigate your way with secret passwords through various angelic roadblocks. And this text is saying you don't need those secret passwords because Christ is superior to all those angels, you just need Jesus. <laughs> okay. So it's in this context then that we're introducing Christ as the creator. God creates the world through him as the instrumental agency. But then, 1-3, Christ also sustains the world with his word of power. So he's not only the creator, he's the sustainer. Sounds like a divine function. And then he's, quote, the exact imprint of God's nature. Now this is... Um, <laughs> The one word is easy. The imprint or the stamp is the word character. We get our word character from it. But think less like moral character and think more like a typewriter character. So you have the typewriter hammer. For those of you who are too young to know what a typewriter is, see us old fogies. Okay. But you had a keyboard like your computer, but it was mechanically or electrically attached to a little metal hammer that had a backwards A on it, and the hammer strikes down, hits a ribbon with ink, and it puts the imprint of that A onto the paper the right way around, obviously. Okay. And so the A on the paper is the exact imprint of the A on the hammer. You know what the A on the hammer looks like because of the A on the paper. They are mirror image matched to each other. See, and so this is the analogy that the Father is like the A on the hammer and the Christ is kind of like the A on the paper. It's the exact copy representation, but not sequential copy, uh, as we're going to see. Um, so unlike a clone, where the clone copy is broken off of and thus is later in existence than the original cell. Uh, this is a contemporaneous uh, thing, as we will see in the text. But he's trying to show us that the incarnate Jesus is this exact representation. This is why Jesus said, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. And the word for nature is a tough word, very rare. It's only used three times in the New Testament, um, hypostasis, and it's probably used two different ways. But um, suffice it to say that hypostasis uh, is universally understood in this context as kind of the, uh, not the essential nature, but kind of the substantive nature, the reality you can get your hands on. Um, a kind of a thing, and hence the idea he's the imprint of God's nature or his essence or what we can experience of God. He's showing the same uh, thing. It's not usia. Uh, that word, I'm not even sure if it occurs in the Bible. It may very rarely occur. They just didn't use it. So, Hebrews 1, 1 to 3, these declarations of Christ as creator, sustainer, of being of the same image, character, representation as God. Is crucial because it's setting up this speech by the Father. And as I pointed out, we have this chronological or temporal marker that gives us the timing that Christ first made purification, and afterwards now God is making these pronouncements about him at his installation into his heavenly office. So we're after uh, the resurrection here. And, uh, um, and so we already talked about that, so I'm going to keep um, rolling here. So, as I said then, Hebrews 1, 5 to 12 is what God the Father is saying about the Son at his post-resurrection installation as the Melchizedekan 
king priest in heaven. So chronologically, Hebrews 1 is after the resurrection. The very first thing that God says about Christ, again when he, God, brings the firstborn Jesus into the world, he, God, says, let all God's angels do what? Time out. I thought we were only supposed to worship God. And yet God is commanding the angels to worship Christ. So if Christ is not fully deity, God's commanding the angels to commit idolatry. So the fact that God is worship Christ is worshiped, okay? In Revelation 4 and 5, they worship the Lamb. Right? So at this coronation, the angels are commanded to worship Christ. This is why the angel refuses to be worshipped by John twice in Revelation. This is why Peter refuses. And yet God says to them, worship this guy. Worship this guy. Major statement about who Christ is. I was working as the volunteer assistant pastor while I worked for pay at the New York van ministry taking blood pressures in New York City. They were trying to give me a chance to show a little bit to see if they wanted to hire me later, which they ended up doing. Ironically, I was doing my first public evangelistic series as the full speaker at the Babylon Seventh-day Adventist Church. Yes, there is a town called Babylon. (laughs) And we have a church there, the Babylon Seventh-day Adventist Church. (laughs) On Fire Island Avenue. I'm not joking. It's the only time I've called people out of Babylon by calling them into it, but I digress. We had a guy coming from a group called the Way International who holds to a very similar view of Christ as Jehovah's Witnesses. And the usual texts weren't working very well. And I took him to Hebrews 1.6, the worship of Christ, Revelation 4, the worship of Christ, and one or two other texts, the worship of Christ, Thomas, right? bows down before Jesus as my Lord and my God. And Jesus does nothing to stop it the way the angels stopped John or Peter stopped Cornelius. So either Christ is God to receive that worship from Thomas or he's the biggest liar that ever graced the face of this earth. There's no in between on this one, okay? And it was the worship theology that broke through to Ralph with the Holy Spirit's help and we were able to baptize him. Already talked about Thomas and the 24 elders. Christ is worshiped, he has to be fully God. Second thing the Father says to the Son in 1.8, but of the Son, He says, who's the he that's saying? God. And what does God say to the Son? Your throne, oh, oh my, is, oh, an eternal statement. The scepter of uprightness is the scepter of your kingdom. So God, the Father, calls God the Son, God. Isn't that interesting? And he ascribes eternity to him. Your throne is forever and ever. Divine attribute. You have loved righteousness, hated wickedness, etc. Therefore, God, your God. Oh, we got two gods in this verse. 
We have Christ God, God the Father, who then called Christ God. So we got Father God and Christ God in one verse. Very interesting. And the function of eternity. But this is the one that will give you an even better headache. Verse 10. Second thing God is saying to Christ at this installation. Oh, and let me say one thing before we do this. Go back to 1.6 for a moment. I'm indebted to my friend Felix Cortez at the seminary for pointing out my old error on this one. So I want to make sure you're clear of what's going on here. Again, when he brings the firstborn into where? Your English is doing you a tough disservice here. Because the word for world is not cosmos. You can go find it for yourself, but in early chapter 2, around verses 5, 6, 7, maybe Matt has it in his head by memory, where Christ is entering the world to come. 2, 5. Thank you. 2, 5, where Christ is entering into the world that's coming. That's the same Greek word as this world in 1, 6. And notice it's the world to come, not the present world. It's literally the idea of the household rule, oikodemos. Okay. The point is Christ is being installed into the eschatological kingdom in heaven. He's not yet brought that kingdom to earth. And he's being installed. And so Hebrews 1.6 is not the Genesis 1 creation. It's Christ being installed into the future world that God is preparing to bring to earth. And he's being installed as king of that world and priest of that world. And so it's in this installation into the coming kingdom, the right Daniel stone that's going to come, that he says now, God's saying to the Son, you whom? Yellow. You, doesn't say God this time, says Lord. You, Lord, laid the foundation of the earth. So the previous one, you, God, that's Theos. Here, you, Kurios, Lord, laid the foundation of the earth in the beginning, and the heavens are the work of... Now, who is this being spoken by? Two, and God says, you the son, you weren't just the agent, you actually laid the foundations and the heavens are the work of your hands. They will perish, but you remain, statement of eternity. They will all wear out like a garment, like a robe, you will roll them up like a garment, they will be changed, but you are the same and your, who's the your here again? The Son. God is telling the Son, your years will have no end. Statement of eternity. But I want to focus on the you, Lord, laid the foundations of the earth. This is a quote from Psalm 102, verses 25 to 27. And in the psalm it just says, you laid the foundations of the earth. But the Septuagint translation that Jesus and the apostles frequently quote from, including here, adds the word kurios, Lord. Why? Because if you go back into Psalm 102, this is expressly a prayer to the Lord, Adonai, hence kurios, except that when the Jews said Adonai, that was a code for something else, for the sacred name. And so we have the sacred name being addressed in this prayer, and you, Yahweh, laid the foundations of the earth, 
They are the work of your fingers. So in Psalm 102, the being who is laying the foundations of the earth is Yahweh, and the Jews, when they see the sacred name in the biblical text, they substitute Adonai, my Lord, and Kurios is the Greek for Lord. And so in the Septuagint, all of these sacred names have Kurios. In addition to confuse you, when you have like the lords of the Philistines or whatever, that's also Kurios, okay? But in the context of Psalm 102 then, the Lord who lays the foundations of the earth is Yahweh himself. And yet now at the installation, the Father is calling the Son by the sacred name. The Son is now Yahweh. He is the Yahweh who lays the foundations of the earth. I find it astounding that God the Father is calling the Son by the sacred name. That is monumental headache. Because I now have two beings who are Yahweh. And yet I only have one God. And I can't explain it. <laughs> I just read it. <laughs> So the Son of God is Yahweh too. And this evokes, this is not the only New Testament place where the sacred name is attached to Jesus. John 8, when Jesus responds to the Jews, before Abraham was, and the Jews knew exactly what he was saying. How do I know that? Because they picked up stones to kill him for blaspheming. They knew what he was claiming, and they didn't like it. And this is part of a larger pattern of equating Christ with Yahweh in the New Testament. I'll give you one more off the, the lips. Somebody sent me an email, and I haven't made it into a PowerPoint yet. They had like 17 or so different places where you can show Christ as being equated with the sacred name in the New Testament. I'm not that sophisticated yet. But let's take another one. Psalm 23, Yahweh is my shepherd, I shall not want. But suddenly in John 10, Christ is the great shepherd. Probable allusion to Psalm 23. But to have God himself apply a psalm to the sacred name to the Son, and he says, that's you. You're the Yahweh who laid the foundations of the earth. Whew. I don't know about you, but I can't argue against God himself. <laughs> yeah, I just can't do that uh, this way. Ellen White, following Hebrews 1. Now understand that in her uh, uh, lack of Hebrew and Greek, she knew Yahweh as Jehovah. We discovered Jehovah was a misnomer. There is no Jehovah. When you take Yahweh, more or less, and you add the vowels of Adonai to it, it can, becomes more or less Jehovah. And so we didn't realize that they were putting the vowels of Adonai under Yahweh as a trigger to say, Adonai, don't say the sacred name. Um, and so we mix the consonants of one word with the vowels of another word, and that produces Jehovah. Ellen White doesn't know that, so she uses Jehovah as the sacred name. But anyway, notice, the incarnate I am, woo, the incarnate whom? Ouch. Is our abiding sacrifice. The I am that is our redeemer, our substitute, our surety. He is the daysman between God and the human. Whoa. She's separating this I am from God in the mediatorial role our advocate in the courts of heaven, etc. The I am, I'm skipping to the next yellow, is our Savior. In Him our hopes of eternal life are center, centered, etc. He is an ever-present help in time of trouble. In Him, by the way, um, I believe that Psalm 46 for the ever-present help in time of trouble would be a psalm to Yahweh as well. Just, you know. 
We must acknowledge and receive this almighty Savior. We must behold Him that we may be like Him in character. As many as received Him, they gave Him. Who is this Him? The incarnate I Am. And those are her emphases, by the way, not mine. She capitalizes the I Am's as an emphasis this way. So she goes this direction. All righty. My clicker is not clicking, but it's on. There it goes. Even more bluntly now, Jehovah is the name given to Christ. Behold, God is my salvation, writes the prophet Isaiah. I will trust and not be afraid, for the Lord Jehovah is my strength and my song. She's quoting the text here all the way down to Isaiah 2 in the middle. And it looks like my screen is running off a little for some reason. But because... You know, trust ye in the Lord forever, for the Lord Jehovah. She's applying this all to Christ and saying Jehovah is the name of Christ. That's her equivalent of saying Yahweh is the name of Christ. So I'm not the only one who's come to this conclusion. I got God the Father saying it in Hebrews. I got Ellen White saying it, and I can't quite read the uh, reference on that slide um, this way. So, Hebrews 1, 11 and 12, the Father applies a psalm of Yahweh to the Son with a statement of eternity of the Son as an attribute of deity. Your years are without end, etc. And this is why in Revelation then, both God the Father and Christ separately are ascribed as being the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. Revelation 1.8 and 21.6 of God the Father. Revelation 22.13 of Christ. He says it himself. I am the Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end. Now, a number of years ago, when I was engaging Gary Hulquist in dialogue, I asked him pointedly if the Father precedes the Son in existence, and he said Yes. And I said, I got a problem with that. Because if the Father precedes the Son in existence, then only the Father can be Alpha. Christ would have to be the Beta and Omega, not the Alpha and Omega with him. The fact that they're co Alpha tells me something, and co Omega. They're both eternal, and in Old Testament theology, Yahweh has no beginning and no end. And the fact that God calls the Son Yahweh is a powerful theological statement about His having no beginning and no end, and hence, you are forever and ever, your days without end, etc., etc. Um, furthermore, um, this is picked up, by the way, in Hebrews 7, um, down the next to last bullet, where Christ is modeled by Melchizedek, who, and understand that the author of Hebrews, whom I accept as Paul, is making his argument based on the record of Melchizedek in the Bible, not necessarily the full actual person. And in the Bible, Melchizedek just appears. We're never told who his parents are. He's never recorded as dying. He just appears as a priest of God, and Abraham pays him tithe, and then he just disappears. And so the author of Hebrews picks up on this, and he says, no father, no mother, no beginning of days, no end of life, and this is like Jesus who has neither beginning nor end of days of life. Amen. So the author of Hebrews is bluntly through the Melchizedek analogy telling us Christ has no beginning. Nor does he have end of days of life. That's a very Yahweh attribute out of the Old Testament. Very Yahweh attribute. Furthermore, John 5, 26 as the Father 
has life in himself, so he has granted the Son to have life in himself. And you've got to wait a minute. Christ in incarnation is in a human relationship to God where he has to be subordinate and act like a limited creature. But even in the human form, God granted that in that subordinate state, Christ still is self-existent. This is why he could say as the incarnate Savior, destroy this temple in three days and I will lift it up. Okay, no one takes my life from me. I lay it down of my accord and I pick it up of my accord. And so that power over his life was granted to him unlike to you and me. In all other areas, he has to live in our limits, but for whatever reason, he has the power to decide, I'm going to lay my life down and you're not going to lay it down till I decide you lay it down. That one aspect of design sovereignty is granted to him in this human form. Because he's making a comparison in the same way that the Father is self-existent, I'm self-existent. And the Father's life is not derived out of another life. And this is why James White uses this text, among others, to argue against the eternal begetting. Because they see the eternal begetting as making Christ eternally dependent on the Father for his life. Whereas they believe, and I would agree with them, that Jesus is making a statement here that he is independently self-existent and not dependent on the Father for life, but when he enters this human subordinate condition of the incarnation, God granted that he could keep that divine attribute as opposed to emptying himself of all the others like Philippians says. For Christ to be deity, his life cannot be derived from someone else. It has to be a self-contained self-existence. And Hebrews points us in that direction, particularly 7.3, if Hebrews 1 wasn't enough, 7.3 finishes that off. And so this is another problem We take Christ who was equal with God, who then empties himself of that equality in Philippians 2, right? Who being in the form did not count equality something to be clutched onto, but emptied himself of that equality to take the form of a human and servant. So he was equal, but he puts away that equality And he takes this new servant obedient, and he has to learn obedience, says Hebrews. I think it's chapter 5, but I'm um, forgetting in the heat of battle for the moment here. Um, So thank you for my student bailing me out, 5.8. Christ was not eternally obedient. It was something new introduced onto him. He had to learn it as a human. And thus, Philippians 2, he became obedient. Because if Christ came under, if we had some kind of hierarchy in the Godhead where Christ comes under orders, then he becomes the hireling and not the good shepherd. But he's not the hireling who comes under orders. He is the good shepherd who sacrifices himself without orders because of his great love of you. So Christ has life in himself. Lunchtime is coming. I need to finish this. We're not far. So, I told you we weren't far. The key markers of divinity found in God the Father are all ascribed to Christ in the New Testament. Christ is holy. He's the creator. He's eternal. He's self-existent. He was worshipped by angels. He forgives sins. And 
He's called by the sacred name, and he takes the sacred name. Before Abraham was, I am. This is why Ellen White says, in Christ is life, original, unborrowed, underived. This is totally incompatible with the eternal begetting doctrine of the philosophers. And by the way, about 10 years ago, Jerry Moon had a paper when we did a Trinity conference back, I don't know, 06 to 09 area, um, maybe a little less. I think I was president of Lex, maybe 10, 2010, somewhere back there. We, he had a paper on James White that blew me away. Because James White argued for the full deity and personhood of, in Jerry's research, the full deity and personhood of Christ and the full deity and personhood of the Holy Spirit. And he was arguing independent self-existence for each one. And so Ellen White, if Moon is correct, Ellen White is directly in line with her husband's theology that was rejecting the eternal begetting. This is why the creedal Trinitarians would probably accuse her and us of tritheism instead of Trinitarianism. Look at this one. Man has no control over his life, but the life of Christ was unborrowed. No one can take this life from him. I lay it down of myself, he said. In him was life, original, unborrowed, underived. This life is not inherent in man. You take those statements seriously, I got some challenges with a begetting doctrine at all in eternity. Now we're going to deal with that begetting text the last presentation of the day, so I won't blow my thunder uh, on it, though if you think about Hebrews 1, you'll have the answer already. And I keep habits, I keep turning that. So it's safe to conclude, in my opinion, that the New Testament presents Christ as fully God with the Father. They are co Yahweh and yet one God. This is why the Word was God, quote, from the beginning. In Christ, the whole fullness of deity dwells bodily, not part fullness, whole fullness. Christ is the very stamp of God's nature, and thus, who being in the form of God, that is in the very nature of God, was equal with God, the evidence is overwhelmingly strong who Jesus is. And so at this point in our study, we see very clearly two persons in the Godhead, Father and Son. Why does this matter? If Christ is somehow a lesser dependent being, it diminishes the gospel. Is he a hireling or did God himself come in person? It makes all the difference in the world how we see the gospel. The Wesleyan hymn captures it well. Amazing love, how can it be that thou, my God, didst die for me? And when I think about who I am and that Christ died for me as his enemy and that he was God himself in the flesh. Makes it hard to talk. Makes it hard to talk. The deity of Christ means everything to us. Let's relish in it. Let's pray. Dear God and Father, we come to you through your appointed mediator, Jesus Christ. The Yahweh who became flesh and dwelt among us. Trying to figure out how there are two of you at this point in our study, who are Yahweh, gives me a headache because Yahweh is one. And yet there's more than one of you. 
And we just have to accept this as how you've revealed yourself and allow that revelation to give us a more balanced and well-rounded view of who you are. We've been wearing out our brain cells and now as we're about to uh, refresh ourselves with nourishment, we pray that you would refresh our minds so that we can continue to probe into your word and stay clear this afternoon. In Jesus' name, let God's people say.